Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains purely theoretical and probably wouldn't even work that well. And today, we are going to discuss weapons again. But this time, weapons that, um, well, uh, definitely go into the realm of mad science. I thought about making it just five weapons that are mad science experiments, but, uh, that seemed a little too, uh, well, overused on this channel. These ones, uh, well, they're all World War II. And they all have to do with a very particular regime with a knack for super villainy. These are five insane weapon projects from World War II Germany. The Mistel. Now the Mistel is a little less Wunderwaffe and more just... What? Mistel is German for mistletoe, which is a parasitic plant. So, Merry Christmas and yo, what is going on here? Why did they crash into each other? No, 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 no. Okay, let me explain how this is supposed to work. The Mistel does not refer to this entire thing. What it does refer to is the unmanned component of a composite aircraft. This setup comprised of a small piloted control aircraft that was mounted above a large explosives carrying drone aircraft, the Mistel. Why would you want to do this? Well, you could pack a lot of explosives into some of their planes. Many of those planes that they were using were kind of obsolete and uh, weren't really useful as planes, so they were just like, let's turn them into bombs. The concept actually dates back to when they were doing something similar, but utilizing troop gliders, not giant airplanes turned into bombs. But as their technique with it became more refined, they realized they could actually create what were basically flying bombs that could be used to destroy their enemies. There were actually several different setups, some deployed, some not, but none of the ones that were actually used uh, really worked that well. The problem was that this setup was, well, slow and clunky. It was difficult to fly this way, for reasons I think are pretty abundantly clear. As a result, enemy fighters found them astonishingly easy to shoot down. It probably didn't help that, well, the largest part of this setup is the bomb, which explodes when you shoot it. The last time they were ever deployed was as late as the 12th of April, 1945, and the last attempt to call the Soviets back as they invaded Germany. It uh, didn't work. The Mistels themselves aren't really preserved, though specific aircraft such as the Fokker Wolf 190 preserved at the Royal Air Force Museum Cosford has the necessary modifications to actually be equipped with a Mistel. So that's something, I suppose. The Feisler Phi 103R Reichenberg. Wait a minute, there's just a V1. V1s are for their flying bombs. They're pulse jet flying bombs. They threw a ton of those over at the UK during the war. No, 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 no. This is the Reichenberg. It's not the same thing. It is, but slightly different. See, this one is designed to be piloted. Oh, yes. In an idea that reeks of desperation, someone decided, how about we have a pilot in these and they can just guide them into their targets. That sounds suicidal, and it was. Though to be fair, the pilots were supposed to bail out at the last second, though they would still probably die anyway. As the war dragged on, the Germans got increasingly desperate, much like the Japanese did with their own kamikaze attacks. But the German hierarchy was actually reluctant to encourage this sort of suicide attack. Hitler himself was actually against it. And even testing them didn't go well at all. The build quality was atrocious at that point in the war due to a lack of proper materials, and the V1s apparently had a very high stall speed, something that wasn't really relevant when they were unmanned. But once a pilot was in them, well, that kind of became a problem if they were to maneuver at all. On the 15th of March 1945, the project was ordered to be abandoned, with more focus being put on the Mistel idea. Which still didn't work, but at least it wasn't a suicide attack. The 
the V3 cannon. Sometimes called Vengeance Weapon 3. Because dramatic is not an aircraft, as you've noticed. We are talking about a large caliber gun that worked on the multi-charge principle. At least three different versions of this gun were built, though the first one was bombed before it was done, and it wasn't able to be used. The other two were used to bombard Luxembourg from December 1944 to February 1945, though it didn't do all that much. But some of you are probably curious, what's a multi-charge principle? Well, it's a concept that actually dates back to the 19th century. In the United States, an inventor Azel Stores Lehman was granted a patent on improvement in accelerating firearms. The idea is that, all right, well, a typical gun, regardless of size, has a single charge that happens in the back of the barrel. When that charge goes off, pressure builds up and throws the shell out of the barrel. That's all well and good, but the setup requires a normal gun to be much heavier at the breech end in order to successfully contain that pressure. And as the gun grows in power, that weight doesn't become tenable at all. The multi-charge principle utilizes multiple different charges along the barrel itself, with a smaller charge in the beginning to get the shell going. As more charges are added and the shell moves along the barrel, it results in a much more constant pressure. This reduces peak pressure as well as the need to have a heavy breech. It also provides it with smoother acceleration. But this setup requires very precise timing, and is not very easy to implement at all. Lyman's original prototype didn't work, but the German version actually did, believe it or not. They weren't very easy to aim, or move around for that matter, and they arrived late enough to the party to be uh, kind of irrelevant. It was interesting technology though, and it was tested by America after the war. Not seeing it as a super useful thing, they wound up scrapping it in 1948. There are still some remnants of these guns, though, including the place where one was mounted, near Mistroy, Poland. The Land Cruiser P.1500 Monster. Oh no. Not another giant tank. Would you stop trying to make super heavy tanks? They're too heavy! And this one would have been the biggest of them all. Now in an earlier video, we were talking about how they proposed a, seriously, this actually did happen, a 1,000 ton tank, the Land Cruiser P-1000 Rot. But this thing, the monster, would have been 1,500 tons. It would have been mounted with the same guns that were used on the Schwerer Gustav railway gun, which we've also talked about as they're the heaviest artillery weapon ever constructed by shell weight and total gun weight, as well as the largest rifled cannon by caliber. Now, it's probably important to mention that this thing um, may not have actually been a serious proposal. It's mentioned in a lot of popular works, but there's no solid documentation for the program's existence at all. It may have actually been just an engineer screwing around, or even an outright hoax. The point is, even if it was considered, it wasn't seriously considered. It was probably thrown out rather quickly because this never was going to work. The rat had enough problems on its own due to the sheer weight of it. Moving across regular terrain without getting stuck would have been a chore, as well as not being able to go over bridges, like, at all. Those issues would have been amplified with the monster by a significant margin. So it's unlikely this thing ever would have actually been made, and even if it was, it would not have been able to move very fast, or very well, at all. The Sun Gun, or Helio Beam. What? No, no, they did not seriously, well, yeah, they kind of did. In 1929, the German physicist Hermann Oberth developed plans for a space station from which a 100 meter wide concave mirror could be used to reflect sunlight onto a concentrated point on Earth, effectively creating a space laser that was powered by the sun. So it's environmentally friendly. Now, listen, if it wasn't clear that World War II Germany is the epitome of super villainy, despite every piece of mounting evidence that you're probably already aware of, then let me just point out to you that they seriously looked into the possibility of creating a poor man's DEATH STAR! 
In World War II, a group of German scientists at the German Army Artillery Proving Grounds began to expand on Ober's idea, which would create a super weapon that could utilize the sun's energy. The sun gun would be part of a space station 8,200 kilometers or 5,100 miles above the Earth. They calculated that a huge reflector made of metallic sodium with an area of nine square kilometers, or even a half square miles, could produce enough focused heat to make an ocean boil or burn a city. Good lord. Now, while they were looking into it, this idea wasn't actually carried out to a significant degree for obvious reasons. The uh, scientists, of course, weren't dumb and knew this would have taken quite a while. They were questioned by officers of the United States after the war, and they believed that the sun gun could be completed within 50 to 100 years. Which, to be fair, admittedly, that's not an unreasonable time estimate. If you think about it, if the Soviets and the United States had put all their resources into building a sun gun, well, it probably would have gotten done. It would have been outrageously expensive and horrifying, and I would rather they not, but it would be doable in theory. But it's probably a really bad idea. Um, I think that's unnecessary. Also, why would the Germans even be looking at something that was going to take them multiple decades? Well, who knows? It may have been a deterrence weapon, or perhaps there were more violent ambitions beyond just what was going on in World War II. And to be fair, an orbiting sun gun that could melt a city does seem like something that would be alarmingly intimidating, not gonna lie. And with that, a special thank you goes to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Some Dude 267, Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Health 444, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsu 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, DM Tribal Typhoon, Tommy Rossini, Ohio Trucker 1, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Alaric Jaspers, Brian Pretzer, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Major Klutz, Ty Hammonds Jr., and Hayden DeGro. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.